To know all about education in the country, tune in every Wednesday after the 8 p.m. news bulletin and they repeat every Sunday after the 1 p.m. news bulletin for the program CTN's Focus on Education with Mark Thompson. Hello and welcome to another edition of the program CTN Focus on Education, reaching you from our studios on 107. Point three FM. I am your presenter, Mark Thompson. In today's edition of the program, the Civil Rights Coalition recently conducted a monitoring tour on all government and government-assisted schools in the western area and northern region of the country. Well, to know more on this monitoring tour, I spoke with Alfonso Manley, the National Coordinator of the Civil Rights Coalition. Well, of course, what we did is to assess wash facilities in school. But when the president pronounced the aspect of the free quality education, one of the areas he realized that is challenging is wash facilities in school. Therefore, when government made an allocation of 21% of its budget, part of the program of that money is to ensure government improve or upgrade wash facilities in schools, which are basically sanitation aspect, the disposal of waste, water, access to water in schools, and adequate toilet facilities. When you mentioned all of these things, one may want to know, what are your assessments? What do you find out so far from those schools? Well, we looked at three aspects. One has to do with disposal of waste. Another has to do with water supply, if it is adequate or not. Another has to do with the toilet facilities. So I'll start with disposal of waste. What we observe in most schools, immediately they clean those schools in the morning, in the evening, they do not dispose the waste. They will put the waste one side of the compound, perhaps for a day of two. And we all know this poses health challenge to pupils in school. Considering a school where we have over a thousand pupils, you know, we have people selling in canteens or in the compound, you have flies, the waste, the scent, it will disturb, you know, you don't have that conducive environment in school. So they will not dispose the waste. And of late, what school does is that they will wait until cleaning Saturday, they will come out with this waste. It is not healthy for learning to thrive in any environment. So we discover that immediately they clean the schools, they do not dispose some of this waste. And in some cases in the provinces, you know, they have very big compound. They will burn this waste on a Saturday and Sunday. So in times of climate change, again, it poses challenge to the environment. And that's one aspect. Another aspect has to do with water, which is very important in school you know after the Ebola, there was a project wherein they supplied some schools with tank and there was a memorandum of understanding between the ministry of water resources and those schools that those tanks will be supplied on a daily or weekly basis so in terms of having access to water in schools the kids will have access to drinking water access to water you know for whatever purpose you want to use it for but sadly enough if you go to so many schools that we visited in the west and the north you find those tanks empty and secondly what we observe most schools where we have those tanks they do not have tap running water so in an instance where you have 500 students and they want to make use of water they only have 20 minutes for lunch perhaps after lunch they want to wash their hands how can you queue with just one tank for 500 people to access at the same time. It's impossible. And also, those tanks, they don't have mechanism, you know, in cleaning those tanks. So you find out that the tap has been cold. So you don't have clean waters coming in out of the tank because the tank is so big, it is difficult to manage. Professionally, school cannot handle it. This is why they sign a an, an memorandum of understanding with the Ministry of Water Resources so they will be rendering this service to the school, but sadly enough, it is not happening. And third, we look at toilet facilities. Of course, they are inadequate. 
and in very poor condition in most of the school. First of all, most of the toilets are drop holes. Most of schools we visited are drop holes. And when you use the toilet, you need to go and wash. So pupils will not use the toilet, they will prefer they go home. So this disturbed the learning process. It disturbed the learning process. In an instance where they could not go home, they will become very uneasy to learn. So whatever I teach them, they will not take in. So we have inadequate, there are very few schools with flush. And those schools, when we spoke to the children, most times it is closed because of the access to water. Because of course, you know you cannot use the flush without mm. adequate water. Okay. It's virtually impossible. So what you want to call so on... Someone, someone might say um, it's unfortunate the time you visited the school, some of these things were not in place, but this is not the case all the time. In order to get it right in the free quality education, you need to get a time on it. You don't announce to the schools when you go to visit, so put everything in place. So what we do is unannounced visits. And when you do unannounced visits, you find out so many things. Of course, we spoke to people, teachers, caretakers of schools. You know, they understand the situation. But the reason for this is to call on the government to say, look, in the 2019 budget, which is 21% of the GDP, you allocated money to improve wash facilities in schools. And this is the second quarter. Mark it, the first quarter is January to March. Second quarter is April to June. So we are now in May. So if we do not have this wash facility being put in place, you know, it will be carried forward. So 2020 budget, if government is going to target infrastructures to build more classrooms, they will not because they will have not tackled the issue of wash facilities. This is why I want to call on the government to say it is very important. They've done assessments, of course, the Ministry of Education, they've done assessments. But very important, they look at the worst facility and try to improve it in order to enhance the quality in the free education. Okay, in order to enhance the quality, one may also want to know how important are all of those things that you have highlighted to this free quality education? Well, in the first place, the environment of school is very important. If you keep the compound Filthy. Learning will not thrive. Pupils will be prone to so many diseases. That's one. Secondly, there is no school that can survive without adequate water. Pupils need water, even not to drink, to wash their hands, to use the restroom, and for some other purposes. They need water. Thirdly, cannot overemphasize the need of toilet facilities. So the issue of wash facilities in school is very important to ensure that learning takes place in an atmosphere that is conducive for the pupils themselves. Mark you, these are kids. These are kids. He also said some of the schools you visited cannot access tap water. And we all know in some places in the provinces, it's very difficult for tap water to be accessed and government cannot afford that at the moment. So what are the alternatives? What are you suggesting that should be done at this moment? One of the alternatives, if you have those tanks, perhaps you increase the number of tanks with several taps. Engineering, that is possible. You know, you have one tank, perhaps you have seven or eight taps on one. Another location, the school, seven or eight taps. So after lunch, people can make use of it. Or at any time of the day, while you are in school, you can make use of it. That's just one. But again, moving forward, it is but fit that school have pipe bon running water. It is, it is necessary. Say it is necessary in the provinces, people have to walk distance to fetch water for the school. How can we enhance quality education? How can we ensure that these kids are learning in school? It's very difficult. Also, um, one we also want to know if you have engaged governments with these findings. If not, when will you and what will be your recommendations to government? Of course, we normally discuss with the Ministry of Basic Education. This is why I want to commend the Honorable Minister Alpha Timbo, the Coordinator for the Free Quality Education, the Chief Education Officer. All of them work with us with an open mind. And some of these of our findings do inform them, you know, so they will in turn, you know, draw the attention of the Ministry of Finance, which is so supportive to the Ministry of Education that look, it is time we access this money to begin to improve on the water, sanitation, hygiene of schools. Finally, if all of these your findings are met by the government in years to come or year to come, what do you think will be of benefit to this free quality education? In the aspect of quality, it will be enhanced. And the access of retention and completion rates as set by the president during the launch of the free quality education, who have children that will stay in school, 
We have children that will take in whenever they are teaching them. We have children that will learn in the conducive atmosphere. And the outcome will be we have better products that will come out and work for this country. And that is benefits of the free quality education. And this is what governments want to achieve in the free quality education. That was Alfonso Mane, the national coordinator of the Civil Rights Coalition, talking there to me. To also know what the Ministry of Education make of these concerns from the Civil Rights Coalition, I spoke with Brahma Michael Ture, the Public Relations Officer of the Ministry of Basic and Senior Secondary Education. Well, the fact that uh, the government, as you said, promised to address those issues means that uh, those issues have been there for God knows how long. Because uh, a government can only promise to fix something if there has been a problem along the lines uh, with those things. And that is exactly what it has been. That for several years, it has, there has been a very serious challenge in the water, sanitation and hygiene facilities in our schools across the country. The very reason why we now have a policy as a ministry that if we're building schools or any partner is helping us build schools, water, sanitation and hygiene should be factored there prominently, otherwise that uh, building construction would not be approved mm -hmm. because we now realize that uh, it has to go simultaneously. The same way that we have also equally realized that uh, because we have a disability community in our school system, schools that are, now, that are now currently being constructed would have to be disability friendly. So all of these reasons are the reasons why we are doing that, because we want to address the problems of shortage of water, the problems of uh, improper toilet facilities and all of that. So yes, if you want the truth, those problems have been there. We've been having challenges in providing toilets and water supply in our schools. But now that is the focus, and we just had a partner quite recently that came. They are called uh, Order of St. John Paul II. They, in their package of what they want to do, also have a component there that has to do with improving toilets and water supply facilities in our schools. You said government is working on improving water and toilet facilities. But one may say it's almost eight months, or if not more than eight months, since the government bring in this free quality education and to provide water for schools who are hosting pupils shouldn't be a problem for government to take this long well i don't know what you mean by shouldn't be a problem everything about providing basic uh, services and uh, social services is a problem because, because most of the schools contingent... that we visited have this this water tank so it's just a matter of filling filling them up and it's the responsibility of the ministry of water resources maybe if you collaborate with this ministry water will be provided to these schools so in the monies that government pay to schools governments and government assisted schools it is expected of the heads of schools to utilize part of that money for the running of the schools and that includes if you have to provide water where a tank is already made available 500,000 loans 250,000 loans 750,000 loans, 1 million loans as the case may be, mm. depending on the size of the tank, should not be a big problem for any head of school knowing that you are receiving money on the basis of the total number of pupils that you have in your school. So that has to be partly the responsibility of the heads of schools as well to make sure that they take from that money and then pay for the water so that water will be made available. So it is good that you or are saying that uh, in some of those schools they already have the tanks so that means it's not government again that is going to go there and say put water here but uh, if they the schools expressed a need for that government can make the arrangement so they can pay directly to the ministry of water resources they have to initiate that arrangement if they really need water supply so that's the thing also so you are saying that the school heads that are responsible to make that arrangement in the other one one may say it's your responsibility to make that arrangement for schools to have water not the school so if the government has to go to every school to find out what they need and then we have a head of school in that school then what are they doing there what is the the headmaster doing in that school what is the principal doing in that school because government does not have the time to go around the schools to go and find out which school has water and which one does not but you have what we inspectors. know is what we know is we have a statistics of schools that do not have proper toilets and water and water wells but for those who already have water tanks you expect the government to go and say make arrangements for water to be brought here when government is paying money to the heads of schools no then what are they doing there it's their personal responsibility if you want your school to 
succeed to make sure that if they don't have water and you just want to utilize the government so that you can get the water supply and you pay for it, we can do that. But we are not the ones who would be initiating that. For those who do not have toilets and water supply, then yes, it's the government's direct responsibility to provide those facilities for them. And that does not happen overnight. Is the ministry have school inspectors in the country? Of course we do. So what are they doing? They are there, as the name implies, to inspect the schools and to see how the schools are running, to see if learning is taking place, to see if the environment where this learning is taking place is school friendly, to see if it's conducive. Yes, that is what they are doing. Mm. But the lack of water would have to be reported by the head of school. Because if you are a school inspector and you go to a particular school and you see a tank, you can hardly actually want to know if there is water in it or not. But the head of school should bring that to the notice of the inspector if they think government is responsible. If they think the money that they are receiving is not one that they could use to buy with the water. But if they don't do that, then why are they there? Realistically, I mean, let's face it. If you are head of a school. But also, Mr. Ture, one may say this government, especially the ministry, mainly prioritize in providing school materials such as book and other learning materials and are leaving out one may say one of the most important aspects which is hygiene the hygiene aspect for the peoples no the government is not leaving out the hygiene aspect i just told you that we have a fair knowledge of schools that do not have proper toilets and water supply based on the census that we carried out quite recently and so we have a clear understanding and so if government is going to construct those things they now know where to do that because we have the statistics that clearly tells us where we don't have toilets and where we don't have um, water wells. But for schools that have tanks, that all they need is to put the water in it, come on man, what are the heads of schools doing? They wait for government to go and tell them put water in this tank when they have the money to do that? That's not fair to government itself. So government is focusing on those schools that do not have toilets and water wells. And that is the focus right now. And so if we have partners, that's why we're collaborating with our partners. Now we want to know which area each of our partners is operating and what they're doing in those areas. So if they want to create facilities for water, we will tell them no. For example, if it's Cambia, no, we have enough in Cambia. Or no, we have enough in Cambia town. There is a village several miles from Cambia where we, we have the need for toilets or for water supply. If you want to help us, you can go there and construct one. That is the reason why we have those statistics. Can you agree with me that lack of some of these things will undermine the free quality education in this country? Lack of anything would potentially pose a challenge to the free quality education. That's why we are addressing everything that we know is a potential challenge. And that means we're looking at all of the variables, looking at prioritizing our interventions. Because keep in mind that uh, there are also competing priorities that government is mandated or obligated to handle. And so if government's focus is just to build toilets and what they call it in our schools, then uh, other priorities will probably be left out. So we're doing that simultaneously, but with the right information from those who are manning those schools as well. And another aspect one has to think about is the area of the health implication this will have on, on people's one may say this can also increase the number of diseases in schools where people are because they are prone to certain things. Because if you go to some of these schools, they, over thousands of people use only one toilet and it has an health implication, as I've just said. So what exactly, moving forward, is the government really doing and ensuring that this come to an end. So, because we recognize that and because we know that is happening, that's why we're providing the intervention. We're making sure that the schools that really need these facilities, we look at them very critically and try to provide those facilities for them. But also do not forget that uh, we, in our schools, we also have topics or subjects that are called health and sanitation. And so, our schools are also teaching about basic health and sanitation. So, where we don't have water, for example, the teachers are also partly responsible for telling the kids or letting them know what they should do by way of an alternative. All of that is happening because we cannot construct all the toilets and uh, the water supply facilities in one day. In all so of if you tell some, someone to do something and there is no capacity for that person to implement some of these things that you are telling, how, how realistic? So that is, that is what is called a challenge that cannot be resolved overnight. This is government. I mean, it's not like a businessman who would wake up one morning and say, I have some 
several millions they are put aside to invest in a particular thing. Government has competing priorities, so we look at uh, what we can do within a certain given period of time, and we do it. So that's how it it works. You know, keep in mind, like I said, it's not like these things are happening only now. These things are not happening because there is frequent education. These issues have been there since probably 20 or more years ago for most schools. For 20 or 25 years, they have not had anything like probably a toilet, a proper toilet or proper water supply. It's only now that the focus has been directed to providing those facilities, working with our partners, and then of course government also utilizing its resources to do that. So that's where we are. The last time I interviewed you, you said government will be bringing in over nine containers of school materials, but never have we heard of government bringing in medical facilities, medical kits for schools. So one may say government is not really prioritizing the health aspect of this free quality education. Well, maybe the Minister of Health will probably answer that properly for you, or the PRO for the Ministry of Health. I can only tell you about what we're doing on education. Like you just said, the only reason why you knew that we were bringing 90 containers of books and other materials because I told you that. Yeah. So let the PRO of the Ministry of Health tell you what they're doing along those lines. I cannot be the most competent person to actually give you that information. Are you not requesting that from them? It is not for us to request that from them. It is... It is for them to, to look at what must be done based on what they have set out by way of their work plan for the year. So we can request all we want, uh, uh, medical facilities or whatever it is, but they have their own work plan. What is their priorities as to what they're supposed to provide within a certain period of time? Yes, do we collaborate? Yes, we collaborate with all ministries. All ministries are directly uh, aligned with what we do. Ministry of Health, of course, is one of them. Ministry of Social Welfare, Ministry of Water Resources, of course, and all of the other ministries, Ministry of Information, so that uh, there is that synergy in terms of what we want to do uh, with our schools going forward. Some of the villages that we visited are very difficult for even motorbike to access. And one of the recommendations that some of the heads of schools are making is for governments to construct water wells in their schools because according to them, it will be difficult for them to access tap one water. So one may also put that to government to know what government is doing in order to create or to establish uh, water wells in some of these villages? It's ongoing. Ministry of Water Resources is doing its own part in terms of uh, providing water wells in certain districts and villages. Our partners are also doing their own part in terms of doing that. We all recognize the fact that these are very, very important essentials that must be provided and we're working with uh, both government and our partners to make sure that uh, that is done. So if you look at anywhere between now and 2023, you would probably discover that the number of toilets in schools and the number of water wells in schools would probably have doubled by 2023. That is the, the, the target and that's the focus. Moving forward, we are fastly approaching the 20, 2020 academic year. How soon, how realistic will all of these things that you have said be implemented or be done by the part of the government? Yeah, I cannot tell you it's going to happen even next academic year. The whole pro- program of free quality education just started and the process of constructing class. Uh, Toilets and water well uh, has been ongoing ever since that I have been working here five, six years now. And so it's an ongoing thing. It doesn't stop. It doesn't have a break. It happens when the resources are available and we do that. And so we keep doing that. So I cannot tell you by 2021, we would have toilets in every school or water supply in every school. But I will tell you the number of toilets and water supply even that, to we, that, some of them, that we have now not say even would to probably have doubled. And so as we move on, by the time we get to 2023, hopefully, we would have created a whole lot of uh, toilets and water facilities in our schools to the point where one would see that as uh, some kind of a positive and appreciable intervention. That was Bremer Michael Ture, the Public Relations Officer of the Ministry of Basic and Senior Secondary Education, talking there to me. That's how we end the first half of the program, City and Focus on Education. Stay tuned as I will be right back after the new summary for the second half of the program. To know all about education in the country, tune in every Wednesday after the 8 p.m. news bulletin and they repeat every Sunday after the 1 p.m. news bulletin for the program Citizens Focus on Education with Mark Thompson.
Welcome to the second half of the program City and Focus on Education. In this half, we shall take a look at the importance of library in tertiary institutions. Well, for more on this, my colleague Musa Bai Sisi spoke with Reverend Oliver Hardin, the senior and acting librarian of the Frabe College Library. Generally, a library is a place where materials are acquired, processed, stored, retrieved, and disseminated in all formats. And the reason why I say in all formats is because we are not just talking about printed materials, but printed and electronic sources. Okay, in essence, um, this day and age, you can still have libraries existing in some other forms other than these physical structures. Exactly, and we call them the virtual library. You can be here and you access material anywhere you know, because of um, access. This library is dated as far back as when you can tell us. According to this, the library existed since the college started within it. M 1827, but this building was actually opened in 1965, and uh, according to the plan, it should have gone beyond the Kennedy Building. The first phase was built in 65. The plan was to extend in 75. That was phase two, and then it should have been completed in 1985. But we are still living in 1965 phase, and it, it's it is named Michael Joliffe Building after an expatriate librarian who worked here in the 60s. It was built, as you said, far back in the days, and it's still existing as the same library. You know? it's, uh, the structure, the structure. That's what I'm saying. This yes, then, then to house about six or 700 students. But now we have over 8,000 students on campus. So how is that a problem, if at all, for you, the librarian? It is, uh, because accommod- sitting accommodation is a big challenge. If a structure originally constructed to house 500 or 600 students is now accommodating thousands of students, then it's a big, big challenge. And presently, the body out renovation is on. Fortunately for us, uh, the entire library is being renovated. So after the exercise would have been completed, there will be more sitting space for the students. In fact, that's the reason why we are even within the collections to create more reading room for researchers. How important do you think Private College Library is? The library is an academic nerve center and uh, as you are also aware, many people in their respective depart- departments, they are registered for a cause, we also come to the library because of what it offers as materials in various disciplines. And uh, it's, it's, it's an academic department. This is not just an administrative unit. It's an academic department. So it, it supports the research functions of the, li- of the college as a whole. Is this library really specifically for Fabi College students? Yes, it is not just for Fabi College students. Also, it can also be accessed by the general public, students from other universities and uh, other researchers. In fact, when other researchers would come to access facilities in the library, we would give them what to call a reader's ticket um, so that uh, they will not sign out any, for any material, but they will access them in the library. So yes, the library is, is here not just for the Fabi College community. It's a research institution and any reader could come in and access materials. So let's come to the specifics for the students of Frabe College. I mean, how accessible is the library for them? I, I can safely say that when even the registration will tell that this is a department that will not waste their time. So how would they encounter problems when the library is open to every, every student? And we have materials, um, different uh, disciplines. We have different collections. Right now, you are in, conducting an interview. You can go around and see if such as are using the library. It's not closed, it's open. Even when some departments may be closed right now, the library is open. And again, are there any form of laid down principles or guidance as to how to come and leave the library? In other words, how to access the library and when you are in the library, what and what is or are expected of you? Yeah, there are some, some so just basic rules and most researchers are aware that in a research institution, the library or department you are not expected to cause uh, noise. That, that's why we always conduct orientation during um, uh, the registration process to tell people how to use the library and where materials are located. That they have any difficulty, the officers that they need to contact. And the library building itself is a very huge one. Do you have where you can store specific materials? For instance, if someone wants to come and read about law or he wants to find out about law, you know, so that that person will be able to locate materials having to do with law. Yes, in, in fact, we use what we call the Dewey Decimal Classification. Each subject has its. Uh, assigned numbers. We don't have a specific room where all the materials are, but we have collections where we have materials, depending on what you want to look for. We'll all in Sierra Leone, you go to Sierra Leone collection. Periodicals, yes, we have some journals, and there's a periodical department, and uh, 
you will see journals related to law. The textbook collection is also there. Fact, the number for law is 340. If you go to 340, even a reference, you see, take all the materials that are related to law. We even have a law department, and that law department has a library. It's one of the departments on campus that. Now, just can, reference uh, in law as one of the, I mean, disciplines. Yes, yes, and other disciplines. Yes, we have many, 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 most of the other disciplines. Yeah, that's why I did say we have the Judas math classification, chemistry is 540, materials are there, physics 5, that's the economics 330, uh, politics 320. So these subjects have their respective numbers. Okay. And, and based on where they are kept, they will tell you um, what uh, the, the focus is. If material is about Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. it will be in the Sierra Leone collection. If it is a uh, periodical, it will be in the journal section of the library. And there are some reference materials. We have a reference section where wow. reference materials. I also have the American shelf that also contains materials on different disciplines on campus. And do you think this place where the library is situated is kind of convenient for the purpose of a library? For instance, there are you know, concerns that um, the library is surrounded with um, so many gardens around. Initially it was, so it's not the fault of the, of the library, but the students themselves. They, they have erected uh, um, all these gardens. And you will agree with me, you will agree, you will agree with me that uh, when there are no um, gardens around, it was relatively uh, quiet. And if, if the library is removed from this particular location, you know this, uh, the terrain is also not too friendly. If you take into the, the, the hills, how student access, it's about access. The library is centrally located. We, we always try to encourage students not to cause noise to disrupt their colleagues, but you can imagine the number we have around. So it's a challenge, one of the challenges that we really have. And but if the location is also changed, it's going to be another problem. All right, so what are some of the, I mean, good things you can boast of as a library, maybe compared to any other library from another institution? Well, the users will be in a better position to comment on the quality of the materials that we have. Let me take the Sierra Leone collection. Mm. That collection houses materials about Sierra Leone. It is difficult to find materials in that collection elsewhere apart from the Sierra Leone Library Board mm. because that library is a library mandated by law to collect materials uh, published on Sierra Leone. So it's a unique collection. That's why it's so difficult to read the materials from that particular uh, unit. Most of the time, researchers come from all over the world to access materials in that collection, materials that we will not even find in the internet uh, in that Sierra Leone collection. So that's one of our unique collections in the library. I have really had the opportunity of talking to some students of Rabe College. You know, one of the issues they raised about this library is that when it comes to you know reading their notes, for instance, the library is available or it's very much up to the tax. But when it comes to doing their research, for instance, they lack the ability to come through and see some materials that are very relevant in contemporary society. In other words, the library archived very old books. No, then it means they are not using the library because at the end of this this interview, I will even just show you. We will not even it will not be a long walk to see recent materials. So if they are not aware of them, how would they use them? How many people are we have in the library right now? But maybe it's for us. It's because we are on a recess. Maybe when 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 the the, 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 the college. That's why it should ask those that are actually uh, using, I will show you recent materials and I will prove it just to show you that there are recent materials in the library. So how, how recent are your books like you are saying? Uh, you cannot be just be in the 90s or the 60s in front of me, hmm. not even aware that you are coming. So, uh, we are doing and to computerize some of the collections. You can see some of the, uh, the, the, the dates here and we are not talking about 60s, 70s or 80s. We have materials that are published even as recent as last year. So it depends. It's a big library. If you go to see a long collection, we cannot read. I can show you newspapers that were purchased this week. I can show you papers that were purchased in the 60s. It's because of the nature of of the collection. I will take you to the American shelf. Just, that, just this collection that is so close. And just look at the dating you know, of the materials that we have. And the American shelf you've mentioned is uh, maybe one of the favorites which people, I mean, students do like to go and read about. I don't know, what's the difference between the American shelf there and the rest of the other, the, the, I mean, areas in the library? The American shelf um, is the most recent collection. And just the, the, the quality of the materials that it houses. But then some students are also not using it, and not even, even aware of, of the American shelf. So in other words, if you want to read quality materials and very recent ones, it goes to the well, it, American well, shelf. It depends on the, the, the area, because there are some areas also that uh, 
we, we, we will not have what you're actually looking for. We will inspect as we did see, we see some materials that are around. Okay. Do you have any departments or, or division of labor in the library? It depends on the departments. It's cataloging departments, not the department that uh, actually process the materials, they catalog them and assign numbers which classification. Their responsibility is different from the staff in, let me say, the issue desk. We are people who register when they, they are um, new users or when they want to sign for materials that are taken out of the library. We have the librarian's office. We have secretarial staff working in the librarian's office. So what does it take for someone to take at least one of your materials outside, maybe for a research or more other purposes, like you've mentioned? You know, you have provision for someone to take your material outside. What does it take? If the person it's has a library card, then he's entitled to, if the student, five books for two weeks. You can review them, provided they are not requested by um, another user. You can also use materials in the library, a collection that... We not, normally don't allow people to sign materials out the close access areas. We have closed collections, we have open collections. But right now we are moving the open collection, Kobadia is, is renovating. And uh, we just completed, or they just completed and handed over the third floor. So we are currently moving materials from the second to the third floor, materials that are normally loaned out of the library. So what's your observation so far with regards to students' usage of the library? The usage is increasing because of internet connectivity. Most of the time, people using the internet we complain that uh, there are not enough seats. They will use this side of the library and uh, the moment one will get up, my office will get the complaint that the seat has been taken over by another individual. Alright, so you are mentioning the fact that um, you even have some form other forms of, I mean, doing library as part of the normal structure that we are seeing now in some parts of the world, if you know, they will like kind of computerize their library. Is that in any way visible here? That's, you... that's exactly what we're doing now. Every week I'm sending to the administration the updated list this every Friday, this is this this one was last week. I'm going to send in the next one or two hours as we computerize on a weekly basis books as well as periodicals. If you, if you go to the, the machine of the, the sect, you see that that's what they're typing. So the next hour, I'll come down again to compile all what they have done for the week and send electronically. So by period, it's, it's a continuous process because if you get any materials, only materials are captured, then we are trying to capture the existing materials. But do you believe people still have the perception that this library, you know, is all about having old books? Hold some of this perception. I'm going to train you what we actually have. So if you have been conducting an interview, you are already biased and see what Maybe I... Maybe you yourself might have heard or someone might have heard and told you that indeed, um, you know, all about Public College Library is about old stuff, old books. No, well, that's not... Nev have you never heard of it? All about Public College Library. That's the point I'm making. You see, I'm showing you and give it time to provide evidence of recent materials, but you are always going to that but that's if you don't have recent materials. We are reading now because we are updating the collections. That's all part of what we are doing. Otherwise, we will just leave all the materials as, uh, as, as they are. So if someone wants to come and do a research, for instance, as probably called the library, what would be the procedure, if any? Most of the time, such as meet me and someone communicate by email or what any other means that they, they want to access some of our facilities. Someone will just come and we take them based on their research request. I will then assign the relevant head of departments because it depends on what the person is researching on. Is this library accessible on the internet? In other words, information about this library is it? Available on the web or other places. There's information about the library. Yeah. You have articles that are published about the library that will be or um, uh, on the internet. But as far as uh, the materials are concerned, this is the university is about to, as a university, launch a portal, and that's why we are sending all this information. So that that information is in the university portal. So mm -hmm. not as a library, but part of the university portal. Yes, our our catalog is represented. All right. Um, the library, is it just accessible to registered students? Because um, on campus, we have those students that are referred to as uh, non-registered students. I have those that are referred to as you know, registered students, whom most times are considered by the university. So what about the library? Is it just for the registered ones or even on the students? Use, like, but that's a problem we also have with, with students. You, 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 how can you, not, you be a student and not registered? I also came to this college. I would register even before I would start my lecture. But they, they, will, they will ask. That's why when you be conduct some of the interview, ask the student. They will tell you that we don't deprive them. We are not, we're not, we're not going to ask whether you have registered before you use the, the, the library. The only, the only issue is you will not sign out for any material if you are not registered because you, you, you have, we have to give you a library card. So mm -hmm. if, if, if you get the, there are some students who will even get the library card before registering. And then they will sign out for materials. We don't deprive students when we're using materials in the, in, the, in the library. They will also confirm it. During examination, I even sign some course forms to the... Some students will even take our past papers and go 
with them. They are using the library even uh, before registration. They will confirm that. Do you give them the pass papers free? No, what normally happens, once you have your, your library card, then you, you are free to use, they don't pay to use the pass papers. Because they are lodged in the textbook collection, normally they are not allowed to take them out of the library. But then they will ask for us to allow them to photocopy. So we'll give them and someone will come out, come down as if they are coming to this photocopy out this section and they sneak out of the library. But then nobody pays for any pass paper. Are there any instances or cases where you've uh, heard of theft in this library? I mean, there's no library in the world. I've been to libraries in the West and people still accidentally and deliberately. That's it. And not only that, the mutilated pages. There are times when students will come with, you see, a complaint that you don't have many copies of relevant texts. And then just to show us that they have removed the pages on some books. So they mutilate pages of essential materials. How is this barrier project that is ongoing that also affects your library? In other words, it also has to do with your library. How is it affecting your work? At the end of the day, it's, it's a blessing in disguise, but now we're under tremendous pressure because we, we, are, we are transporting materials from one floor to the other. Things have to be scattered. and that, That's one challenge, that, one of the challenges we have now. We are moving the textbook collection to the third floor and you have to move all of the books. And according to administration, college will be open soon. We don't have that man part to shelve all of them against that. That we have to move other areas, so it's a big challenge. But at the end of the day, that's because I saw the, the, the lift. I came to college in the '86. The, the lift was not working, but now, now Badi has renovated the lift. So for decades, this is the first time the lift was operated for the college library, and the library has not, has not been painted for a very long period. At least uh, there is a, 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 a facelift. And uh, I went to the third floor. I saw the air conditions. So. It, it, it's a step in the right direction, even though it's challenging now to manage work and uh, the renovation. But it will be something that will benefit everybody. So we have to just go along with what we have now since the entire library's renovation is completed. Uh, do you partner with other universities? Uh, we, we do. I just sent a letter. And in which sense? A, a, a membership invoice to even pay a membership dues out of African Association. So we partner with, with a, a lot of institutions. Okay, on which basis mostly? As far as research is concerned, we are even working on the library consortium right now, putting together a group of libraries. Because when you work as a team, it's easier to get resources even from, from donors. And what's your relationship with um, the Australian Library Board? In fact, I want you to know that 2000 and, 2005 and 2018, I was even a member of the board, so I work closely with the Seven Library Board. Is it possible they could have materials that you don't have, or, or you would have materials that they could not have? Yeah, possible. Every library in the world, even the best library in the world, will tell you that you will not access everything. There is no library that will have everything. So we have what they don't have. They also have what we don't have. But we, we are partners. All right. So uh, moving forward, like you saying, the, the barrier project is almost coming to an end uh, with the renovation. And then the library is also part of that. Um, what is actually hopeful of the college authorities and maybe the students who are also beneficiaries of the, the, the library, what are they to hope for moving forward? Well, that's about renovating the, 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 the structure. So we're expecting to see uh, um, a more improved physical facility. That's what they are here to do. That's their own mandate. Any plans as to expand in the library? As you yourself mentioned, it's now housing or hosting, you know, well over a thousand students or so. No more. Ask your talks, they'll tell you that initially, yeah. the, 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 the initially the, the plan also include the library. That one is, I'm an employee of Fabric College. I cannot extend Fabric College library. It is the responsibility of the administration and it's, it's a lot of resources. Talking about connectivity, if someone wants to know about this library in depth, um, is it the case that except he or she comes to Fabric College? Or it's possible elsewhere. You know, that, that's the purpose of the university portal that is about to be launched. You, it will have information about the library, so you don't need to come to the library. You can access it. Even the issue of, uh, for the very first time in the university, the issue of application, you don't need to do it physically, it's going to be online. That, that was the promise the president also made to the president of this country. But before now, you have no way to have information about the library except it comes to Fabric College. Is that the case? No, even uh, if, it, if, if even before now you can still go online. I have articles about Fabric College online that you can. You don't need to come to Fabric College Library to access. But uh, now it's like going to be concentrated because of the the the, um, the portal. There was no portal before now. But now uh, we can boost up the portal. We have information 
will be stored. That's why you're updating on a weekly basis. It is, you cannot capture it in one day. That's, it's not possible. Periodically, you get a whole chunk of your information and to be accessed online. So finally, what will be your message to the public, most so students of Frabi College or people that have to do Frabi College with regards to the, the library? Everybody is free to hold his opinion. Make sure you, 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 you live with the relevant authorities and get the relevant information. I cannot control what somebody, the thoughts of an individual. There are many researchers that are using the library. And I talked to Professor Kago, who said that most of his materials, he was even in the library this morning. He's a professor, and most of the books he published for materials that uh, are housed in the college library. And in this age, we are talking, we are talking about also about um, connection, co connection, not just collection. Because of the World Bank project, the library is also part of it, all university campuses are benefiting from uh, the uh, um, uh, connectivity. You can be here, and uh, once there is connectivity, you conduct your research. What you need is access. That's a list of all um, several websites, functional academic websites. You can uh, be in the library and you access your materials from many libraries in the world. Because that's the, 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 the movement in this particular age. It's no longer about collection, it's about connection. So once you have strong connectivity, you will then have access to millions of articles. That was Reverend Oliver Hardin, the senior and acting librarian of the Frabe College Library, talking there to Musa by CC. That's how we end the program CTN Focus on Education for this week. If you miss part or the whole program, please tune in on Sunday 1 p.m. after the news bulletin for the repeat. On behalf of the entire staff and volunteers of CTN, I have been your producer and presenter, Mark Thompson, saying goodbye.